Hello, I'm Ben. Today we're going to be chatting with Antonio Robodao. Nice to have you here, Antonio. Hi, Ben. Uh, thanks for having me here. In terms of my background, uh, I, I spent half of my career in academia and then I moved to the private sector in 2012. Uh, my background is in mathematics and later in electrical engineering. Um, I also tried uh, to do a PhD in machine learning, but I dropped out after a while. It was not for me, and I have been a happy man since then. I spent many years doing um, a bit of everything, so machine learning, applications, CDA, statistics, a bit of everything. And uh, in the last three years, I, I'm, I'm moving into... Um, the engineering side of productionization of data science products and services. The topic of this conversation is going to be around data science and how the how the role has evolved uh, in the past 10 years. Taking things from the most obvious perspective, which is the technology side of things, um, and in engineering, I've seen a lot of changes in the past 10 years, like tremendous changes. Um, which has impacted every single role. From your perspective, what are some of the technology changes that occurred which are most drastic in the data science field? Um, well, there are some changes that had a huge impact in the, in the last 10 years. And uh, out of my mind, immediately I will think about the, the introduction of Hadoop precisely like around 2009 or 2010 basically kick-started uh, a big data movement uh, inside data science. And then at a later stage, Docker, that also revolutionized the way as uh, software engineering is done and supports uh, data science. And we could not uh, see the cloud computing capabilities that we have at the moment without uh, Docker. About Hadoop, nowadays we can see powerful tools for big data engineering like Spark, um, data streaming, Kafka. So Hadoop like started uh, getting noticed around 2010 uh, and it basically kick-started uh, a whole big data engineering movement. Uh, and at the later stage, uh, Docker maybe 2013, 2014, that also changed how uh, data science is ser serviced. So we have new tools from a containerization perspective and also from um, from data pipeline perspective as well. Um, so we're now able to create all those new pipelines and to manage them properly. For example, before we used to create virtual machines uh, or servers were expensive, both in maintenance and in cost. and with things like Docker and uh, infrastructure as code, DevOps, um, you, we could um, access uh, in a very easy way uh, platforms to run uh, data science experiments uh, and products. And that uh, also justifies why data science is getting more specialized and in my opinion, moving uh, closer to an engineering environment um, because the type of person that you will get in data science like 10 years ago it will it will be uh, often focused in a, an academic profile people with um, excellent uh, skills or research skills in uh, economy physics uh, math mathematics. Nowadays, there is a strong emphasis in big data tools like Spark. You, you're talking about this and I'm trying to get a good understanding of what we mean by a data scientist, especially nowadays when we say data scientist in 2020. What does it mean? I think data scientist is still a very wide term that can include many different sub roles. I think uh, the, the market and society is becoming a bit, uh, having a clearer vision of what's a data scientist. But uh, you can see that data scientist is still a very wide term 
that can include many different roles. But nowadays, you can start seeing a specialization inside the field. You, you see the research scientists, you see the, the data analysts, you see the data engineers, you see the machine learning engineers, uh, you see uh, data scientists more uh, from a, a, an exploration, uh, so a data exploration perspective as well. So I see that the, and of course, the visualization experts, uh, and then there is also the full stack in uh, full stack data scientists that can go from the raw data to understand how the value, the business value should be uh, linked to people that will be hiring quantitative teams. They were like mostly getting uh, hiring e economists, mathematicians, phys physicians. And there was a, a huge compartmentization of the, those roles. So someone that will be working as a data analyst often will be working in a specific domain and, and task. I think that started, and at that time, the pr proprietary solutions were extremely popular, like MATLAB or SPSS or uh, SAS or Mathematica. And around 2010, uh, you could start seeing Python being adopted both in academia and in a, in the private sector uh, and R as well. And this shift between proprietary solutions to open source um, was also extremely important because that created um, all these amazing open source movements that currently we use daily in our work, created these amazing communities and software engineering without open source will be a very different world. In a sense, actually, I think that all those technical improvements have increased the reach of technologies, especially for people who might initially not have been technical. So if you take the example of a business analyst, Nowadays, what you expect from a business analyst is to be able to pick up an IPython notebook and to be able to write a couple of lines of Python. Um, all of this would be running in the cloud. And so they would actually be able to manipulate large amounts of data and to kind of um, ask questions uh, and try out different things with data, um, which is definitely the kind of thing that you wouldn't have it expected 10 years ago correct the um, definitely that is a is a reality nowadays the um, because it's easier to access the the tools the it's less the entry the um, the knowledge to start using those tools is uh, also lower than it used to be at the same time it's is really easy to to learn those tools. And this is, of course, changing the, um, how we work. There is also um, a, a shift in mentalities in companies where businesses understand that uh, they need to be data-driven or at least that, that data-driven uh, processes can support their expert domain. I think data science uh, changed dramatically in the last not just in the last 10 years, I will say 12 years, even if maybe 12, 13 years ago, we will not really call it data science, but there were lots of companies already doing uh, quantitative work um, and not just engineering companies that by nature, they will be the ones um, doing signal processing and applying statistics for trading. But at that time, it, these, these roles will be more like known as data uh, data analysts eventually e economists will also i think be... what we've seen a lot is all those roles have become more of a commodity um and it's very easy nowadays for businesses to set up uh, i mean any business could kind of set up a machine learning algorithm in production nowadays uh, and and have uh, their services running off of it. Whereas if you were trying to do this like 12 years ago, it would be a lot harder. So, so I imagine you have a lot of engineers, people without a scientific background um, who are now tinkering with this kind of technologies and who are now actually using it uh, within their businesses. Yeah, uh, definitely. The, um, so basically the, the democratization of data science, I think it also... Uh, 
you know, everything helped. It's like uh, difficult to touch so many different things that that uh, allowed us to be here. But but we cannot also forget the um, the online platforms that will be delivering the the massive open online courses like Coursera or, or Audacity. So around 2011, uh, it was when Coursera started with three uh, uh, co uh, initial courses. Uh, one on SQL, one on machine learning, and one on um, on self-driving cars. Uh, and that, for me, it was a, a very important uh, moment because suddenly it democratized as well learning. So you, it doesn't matter if you have a a, a full-time job or that you live in the countryside or that you have less money if you ha basically if you have a, a, an internet connection and some time you could access these courses for free and learn something new or even learn new skills uh, without being constrained by a lack of time or money um, or by not having a, a schedule that will fit with the conventional uh, uh, learning. Uh, and that for me it was also a revolution that had caused a huge impact in uh, data science and engineering. And in terms of tools, the transition between proprietary solutions and uh, open source uh, tools uh, had also a massive impact because in data science you have like three, four languages that are the, the ones that almost everyone uses. Like, And I would say like Things like Julia or Scala or Python are are the ones that almost everyone is using at the moment. And then uh, projects like Jupyter Jupyter notebooks that started as IPython project, um, it also changed uh, how you can move work uh, around because suddenly you are not constrained by. Um, by having specific plugins, or you can make a Jupyter notebook and uh, in different languages, and in the end, using version control, you just share that, so it becomes uh, really portable. Yeah. So, so your personal experience is actually um, you've worked quite a lot with speech recognition. So, for example, uh, when I was doing speech recognition, was like around two thousand nine, two thousand ten. At that time, the state of art will be mostly based on on um, hidden Markov models. It was still a, a very much a supervised uh, task where you have basically a, a set of phonemes that you want to to identify. Hardware was expensive. Uh, well, you had to buy and maintain hardware uh, on your own. So in the end, it will be often universities. Um, maybe I'm biased in my, in my view, but uh, that time I was in academia, so I could see that um, buying this cluster of machines and maintaining them, and it, it was not an easy task. And then uh, you also had limited data sets. Everyone was doing their experiments in the same data sets, and, and hardware was limited. And around that time, there was also an explosion in terms of uh, of hardware uh, memory and uh, and processing power together with uh, uh, that somehow also, uh, allowed us to store and process uh, more data okay um, what was the practical um, implication of your research for the world nothing but for <laughs> myself <laughs> but for myself i i learned uh, i learned a lot and uh, it was a special and good moment of my life. I think I will not be here without that. It also made me what, what I am today. So I think my attention for detail and the thrive for uh, being rigorous, I think it came very much from my experience in academia. At one point in my life, uh, 2012, I realized that it was not for me and I moved to the private sector. Right. Um, but I'm very grateful and happy about what have what, what I uh, have done. I did like basically like anybody else. I did some publications in in Japan. I was doing speech denoising, so trying to filter out noise out of speech, and late and also a bit of speech recognition. And then later uh, I moved into 
speech synthesis, and then I came back to speech recognition. And uh, around 2012, I, I moved to the private, private sector. Looking at this move to the private sector, so that's when you started to work within product teams and, and actually build products. Let's say the at that time, um, the it will not be expected that the data scientist will uh, will will do um, uh, good uh, code good enough to um, to be uh, able to move to production. So uh, at that time there was a a strong uh, bond between um, data scientists and software engineers where basically the data scientists will be prototyping uh, while the data engineers will be um, productionizing uh, some uh, those products. Um, and, and actually, I think this is something that we see a lot, um, especially for larger companies. So you have data scientists uh, defining and building algorithms with quite high level languages like Python or R, and then data software engineers will come in and will rewrite them in much lower languages like as C++, um, you know, to make mm -hmm. those uh, algorithms much more efficient and basically production ready. Definitely, but uh, you can also see sometimes that even that is changing because um, like uh, five, six, seven years ago, definitely that was the reality. And it is, it, it is still what's happening for when you want to have really very low latencies uh, in some sectors like, like finance, people are still rewriting basically the, 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 res the, the output of the research from these um, data science teams is very much translated into low level languages in order to reach the, the lowest la possible latency because that in the end matters when you are doing like trading or or other financial applications but you can also see that that is changing in other scenarios so when you don't really need to have ultra low latencies uh, and you just want to have a good performance uh, mm -hmm. you can you can see many pr 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 many products being being be built uh, directly in in python um, and the whole ecosystem of tools to do it uh, also uh, followed this need so um, so you have um, basically great tools in order to deploy these directly in the cloud. Uh, for example, in, in, in data models, you can, uh, I give an example. So there are these three famous cloud providers and all of them, they have they machine learning services where you can do your own, uh, the research, the exploration part of data science in the cloud using basically notebooks or, or just doing normal scripts or, or, or uh, models. And you do after you are happy with the output of of your modeling, you can directly uh, production produ basically place that into in a way that you that it's being serviced. So you, now you can use that model by get uh, by sending data and getting a response um, that uh, fulfills a specific function. So there there are lots of things that that changed. So you, you will not have those tools or it will be not as easy to productionize uh, uh, some years ago. Uh, and that actually will be, there will be a gap. The data scientists will, that will basically be doing the R&D and then you will have the software engineers doing the more the D part of the R&D. So the development itself and the productionization. I, I definitely imagine the field of data science to evolve and to focus on different problematics and the ones the problems which have been solved um in the past 10 years well now you have services for them uh for machine learning well you 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 have tensorflow you have keras all, all the services are within reach for for software engineers so so i'd say data scientists can actually focus on different kind of problematics at this stage, especially with those new focuses of businesses, uh, especially towards data. So data 20 years ago was not 
really a major element for businesses. But if you see large corporations really focusing on their data strategies nowadays, um, then you have all those new roles focusing on data, which all of this spawns from the new innovations um, and the new technologies available um, to exploit this and to actually create new services and, and to create value for businesses. Um, so I'd say data science as a field, let's say, from my perspective, it's still extremely relevant, um, but it definitely doesn't do the same, it, do, it definitely doesn't solve the same kind of problem um, as five, five, ten years ago. Uh, definitely, the things are, well, they are in constant um, change. So what we can see is there, there is definitely a merge between um, so like while, while some years ago, like data science and software engineering, they will be basically working together, but often uh, people in one will not go to the other. Nowadays is the opposite. People from one go to the other and, and vice versa. And this pollinization of fields uh, is extremely rich. Um, that, for example, nowadays you can, you, you, you hear about the full stack data scientists while well, some years ago that will be basically some something a bit uh, strange the the field will keep evolving in a uh, in terms of needs in terms of uh, of roles that, let's say we will likely live in a world that where everything is is interconnected so the um, the internet of things i think will bring us uh, massive amount ma massive amounts of data that will create new problems and will offer also new poten potentialities it's fashionable to speak about data driven analysis that can support uh, business and so on but this started but it still has a long way to go because it's not just a, it it's also about the revolution because suddenly people the decision makers in companies they also need to to listen and to embrace uh, and adopt these data-driven processes. It's not just about saying that we do it or that we are doing it. Until we are entirely happy about what we are doing, we cannot stop. Um, so there will be new jobs. So I think there will be a, a higher demand and more data and new problems. So things will keep changing and moving. The same with tools. The final question I, I really wanted I, I wanted to ask you is around the next stages for data science and and where what you think will be the next type of problems um, that are really important and and how it's going to shape um, the discipline in the future. I think that um, understanding what uh, our customers do. Uh, will keep supporting uh, data um, science uh, demand for a long time, then I think uh, Internet of Things will bring us uh, some challenging problems and applications. I will see a, a higher demand for understanding what uh, our customers and processes are doing uh, and the Internet of Things will also bring um, new new applications and new problems. Thank you very much, Antonio, for your time. It was lovely chatting with you. Well, thanks for having me.